Exciting. Thank you. That is, that is a remarkable woman. I'll tell you right there. She is my hero and a champion. I, uh, I'm honored to be with you. We're, uh, we're united tonight in a lot of things. We're united in the love we have for this great country. We're united in our belief in the sanctity of human life. We're united in our belief in the importance and significance of marriage between one man and one woman. We're, uh, we're united in our belief in America. And uh, tonight as we gather, we're also united in our concern for America because our country is in peril. About three years ago, America did something, which is the kind of thing Americans do from time to time. We elected someone new to be president. We didn't know much about him, didn't have much of a track record, but he was uh, extraordinarily uh, gifted as a speaker. His soaring rhetoric and promises of change and hope convinced the American people to give him a try. And now, a third year into his four-year term, we have more than rhetoric to go by. We have his record. Barack Obama has failed the American people. When he uh, took office, his number one job, in addition to caring for our troops overseas, was to get the American ec economy to turn around. And so he came to the American people and said, look, I want to borrow $787 billion. And if you let me borrow that kind of money from China and others, I'll be able to hold unemployment below 8%. It hasn't been below 8% since. And today it ticked up, as you know, to 9.1%. And so now, three years later, we have high unemployment. We have 20 million Americans out of work or stopped looking for work or in part-time jobs where they wish they could get full-time jobs. 20 million Americans. We still have, three years later, home foreclosures at record levels. Three years later, we have declining home prices. Three years later, we have debt piling on debt. We have as much debt now at the federal government level, almost as the size as our, of our total economy. This presidency has been a failure. And what does he have to say about this? He says, I'm just getting started. No, Mr. President, you've had your turn. It's now our turn. We're the ones that are just getting started. And did you hear, did you hear what he said today about the 9.1% unemployed Americans? He said that's just a bump in the road. No, Mr. President, that's not a bump. That's Americans. People unemployed are not just statistics or bumps. If, if you have this number of people unemployed, you have, you have college kids, for instance, that can't go to the next semester, some who can't even go to college. You have people, young marrieds, who want to start a household that can't afford to do so. You have uh, marriages that sometimes break under the strain of unemployment. You, uh, you have people who are 55 years old in the prime of their life, out of work, wondering if they'll ever get another job. This is not just a crisis. This is a moral crisis that we face in this country. And with this crisis going on, the president is in uh, uh, the Midwest today, taking a victory lap about how successful he's been in uh, dealing in the automobile industry. And so he's, uh, he's taking a victory lap at the very time we have more people announced today that are out of work. It's... Uh, it's an extraordinary thing. I don't think it's possible to solve a crisis if you can't see a crisis. And this president does not see a crisis, and we do. I, I also think it's a moral tragedy for us to pile up more and more debt that we know we can't possibly pay off during our lifetimes and pushing that onto the next generation. I think it's totally inexcusable. I want to make sure that we as a as a uh, generation, and generations in this room, pass along a torch to the next generation rather than passing on a bill for our excesses. And we're going to do that. Now, I, I sometimes wonder how it is that the president has been so wrong in his guidance of the economy and the nation. And uh, I'm reminded of what Ronald Reagan said. He said, it's not that liberals are ignorant. It's just that what they know is wrong. <laughs> and he's proven that, hasn't he? But there's something more than that. I think whether it's the inspiration that came from the, uh, the faculty lounges he's been in or, or whether it's the inspiration that comes from watching the policies of the Europeans, but, but much of what he's done is similar to the policies that you've seen come out of Europe. So 
with, with our economy in trouble, he did what they did. He, he spent more money and borrowed more money. W with people out of work, he, he did what the Europeans did. He, he pushed unions and, and, and saluted the union bosses. With, uh, with health care having difficulties, he said, let's have the federal government take it over, just like the Europeans did. With, with energy challenges, he did the same thing they did. He pursued cap and trade. He thought higher prices would help us out. Look, the European solutions don't work for Europe. They're certainly not going to work for America. The right... The right answer for America is to believe in the principles that made America, America. For instance, I believe in American free enterprise, American opportunity, American freedom and liberty. I, I uh, tell you briefly a story of my dad. My dad grew up poor. His dad went broke more than once. My dad learned to be a lath and plaster carpenter. He could take a handful of nails, put them in his mouth, spit them out pointy side forward, and then nail them one by one. And, uh, and then when he was, uh, of course, he couldn't get the, the time or the money to put together to get a college degree, didn't graduate from college. But then when he got married to my mom, they went across the country. He filled the back of the trunk with uh, aluminum paint, and he sold paint along the way to pay for gas and hotels. Now, my dad believed in America. He believed in the opportunity that America represented. And so he was able to grow up and ultimately become the chief executive officer of one of America's leading car companies. And he also became the governor of a state where he once sold alum aluminum paint. This is, a, uh, this is a nation where the circumstance of your birth is no barrier to your achievement if you dream. This is a great land. I believe in free enterprise and capitalism, by the way. In this campaign, we're going to have to have somebody who can stand up for those economic principles that help us lead the world economically. And, uh, and I can do that because I've lived those principles. I, uh, I believe in the Constitution and in the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, by the way, which limits the power of the federal government and preserves powers of the states. If, if I'm lucky enough to be president, I'm going to go through the federal government and take dozens of programs that are in the federal government and return them to the states and to the private sector where they belong. And, and the mother of all power grabs, I will also return, the mother of all federal power grabs is, of course, Obamacare. We're going to get rid of that. I believe in the principle of limited government. Government's too big. Do, do you realize how much government at the federal, state, and local level now accounts for in our economy? About 40% of the total U.S. economy is accounted for by government. The federal share of that is about 25% of the total economy, of the GDP. In my view, what I would do if I'm President of the United States is to say we're going to limit we're going to limit federal spending to 20%, not 25% or 30%, which is where it's headed, but to 20% of the GDP. And we're not going to raise taxes, and we're going to finally balance our budget and keep America within its means. I believe in America. I believe in freedom and opportunity. I believe in free enterprise and capitalism. I believe in the Constitution. I believe in limited government, and I believe in the greatness of America. When this president went around the world at the beginning of his administration and apologized for America, I was appalled. This is the greatest nation in the history of the earth. The sacrifice of our sons and daughters is unequaled in, Ameri in, in world history. This is a sacrifice made to preserve liberty for ourselves and for others. This is a great nation. And there's no reason to be ashamed or to apologize for America. We are proud of America. You know, I also believe in the greatness of the American people. Now, I know it's fashionable in some corners to get a little discouraged sometimes about what you see other Americans do. And I think in part that's the, the, the news and, and, and the things that we're drawn to are the unusual. And... Uh, and yet, if you get a chance to do what I got a, the chance to do, which is to go around the country running a presidential campaign or in one, 
you, you get the chance to meet a lot of people and to learn a lot about them. And, and I've had the occasion, as you know, to be in business 25 years of my life. I, I joke that I, I spent 25 years in business. I was only governor four years. I never inhaled. I, I'm still a private sector guy. <laughs> and so I got to meet people in, 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 in the normal walks of life, in, in the real world. And then I went to the Olympics and got to meet young people from all over our country and all over the world. And, and then I became governor of my state and, and applied some of the same principles in governing a state that I had in business, which is taking on tough problems, cutting back excess, making tough choices. I was proud that we balanced the budget every year for four years. We lowered taxes 19 times. And when I was finished, we put in place a rainy day fund of over $2 billion. But uh, yeah, that would help, wouldn't it? But what I drew most from these experiences was the confidence I have in the American people and the greatness of the American spirit. I remember one day I was uh, in my office. I was serving as governor. It was toward the end of my term. And we got a call from the airport. And, and they said that a soldier's body was being returned to our state, coming in on a U.S. air flight, but that the family had not been able to be notified in time to get there to receive the body. And the family had asked if I would come to the airport to receive that body. Of course, I said yes. We drove over to the airport. And uh, the police car took me out on the, on the tarmac, and the jet came in. The people disembarked, and then the luggage came down the conveyor. And then finally, the casket came down the conveyor. And the, and the state troopers who were there with me, they all saluted. And I put my hand on my heart. And I happened to glance up at the terminal. There's a big wall of glass at the U.S. Air Terminal in Boston, right where we had come in, or where this plane had come in. And the people coming off the plane, they'd seen all the cop cars. So they'd lined up to see what in the heck was going on. And then uh, people walking down the hall, they saw the people against the glass, so they pulled in behind them. Huge crowd up there, as I looked up there. Every single person I saw had their hand on their heart. And I couldn't see tears through that glass, but I could see the faces. The sincerity, the appreciation, the love for the sacrifice of that great soldier. We are a patriotic people. We face extraordinary challenges. The American people rise to the occasion. They ask for one thing a leader that will tell them the truth, who will live with integrity, and will actually lead them in the direction that we need to go to preserve this great union. Now, we've lost a couple of years, but we haven't lost our way. The principles that made America the hope of the earth are the principles that will keep us the great shining city on a hill. It's time for us to come together and to carry our message across this country that we're taking back America, we're restoring those principles that made America the great nation that it is. Because we believe in America, we're going to keep America strong, the hope of the earth, worthy of the great sacrifice of those men and women who sacrifice for us even today. Thank you so much. Good to be with you today. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.